All right, so this is <laughs> video number five, attempt three. Uh, hopefully Windows will not attack me anymore. Uh, so, quick recap. Andrew, Cox, J.J. Boyd, Justin Wilson. It's the full team. So this is the We're part the where, we, where, where we take our rings and we combine them. Like that. And then... Uh, Captain Rowder? Captain Rowder. Uh... <laughs> I, I think I think you're the closest one to having a, a green mullet, Andrew, so you get to be Captain Router once everything combines. <laughs> All I know is I don't want to be the guy with heart. He was like the lamest. He couldn't do anything cool. Um but you get you get a pet monkey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that unless you're gonna like teach him to steal stuff, he's pretty useless. <laughs> I think of that. Although he might be good at picking up women, I don't know. How how enticing is a is a monkey to a woman? They love cute furry things, right? It totally work. So, I'm switching gears. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps where I was trying to start before was the wrong thing. Maybe that's that's fate's way of telling me that I was doing it wrong, or Microsoft's way of telling me I was doing it wrong. You know, whatever. Um, bow to my uh, Microsoft overlords. So, uh, somebody had a, a question, which I think was a really good question, and it was basically surrounding. Um, it would be great if you could talk about how to future-proof your networks, or maybe even how you. Try to upgrade. I'm guessing he's talking about how you upgrade now to kind of solve tomorrow's problems, or or what's the best way to kind of uh, plan for the future. I think, um, and I think um, uh, that word right there, plan, is probably the very best thing uh, to start with. You really you need a good game plan. Uh, most people's wireless networks, it seem like, uh, they decide hey you know I just need some connectivity from here to there how do I do it I'll do uh, a shot off this grain elevator or something similar to that off the silo and then I'll get to my network and uh, from there somebody else needs a little bit of connectivity so they start from there and then things just seem to kind of grow organically you know from one place to the next and they don't really have a game plan to start with and I think that's gonna be uh, about the time once they start getting loops and stuff like that that they end up calling people like like us here um, so I think step number one is have a plan. Come up with a good solid network design and something that's uh, repeatable, you know, and move forward. And when I say repeatable, uh, the thing that usually pops into mind is cookie cutter. And I know Justin um, has been building up material for the mom for for a conversation specifically about that. Am I right? Yep. Yep. One of the one of the things I always, uh, you know, I I see this on a lot of the the lists. I see this on the the ubiquity forum. You know, guys are on there and gals are on there. You know, trying to make their ATs do all kinds of stuff. You know, VLANs and some some people are trying to make their APs doing routing and and things like that. My you know my major thing is make everything as modular as possible. Um, you know, my current current design is, you know, every site has two routers. Um, one I consider a uh, backbone router. You know, backhauls are connected to it. It participates in, you know, whatever the uh, uh, internal routing is, you know, usually OSPF. And then I have a AP router um, that handles all the, the customer functions, you know, access point, um, you know, throttling, uh, triple POE concentration, you know, stuff like that. Um, that way, um, and we, we've talked before about, you know, in one of our last ones about, you know, multiple routers for BGP. You know, the, the, in my opinion, the less the router does, the easier it is to upgrade it. For sure. You know, so if you have, you know, two routers at each site um, and you need to go in and say, you know, you need, you know, the latest, greatest, you know, function that may only, you know, do do routing. You only have to upgrade one router um, and it's, it's not as detrimental to the entire network. Um, you know, we always have the human factor. You can mistype something or whatever, so the less things that you have to worry about, the better. Yeah. Same with your APs. You know, APs should be just, to me, just dumb bridges. You know, they, sh they shouldn't be routing, you know, anything like that. So you come along with, you know, Andrew mentioned, uh, you know, one time 802.11ac. You know, hey, if I want to drop in a new, new latest, greatest uh, access point, 
I don't have to worry about you know bugs in the the software too much. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's not doing much, there's not as much room for it screwing up. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, that's super, uh, super important to to point out that you are going to hit bugs. You know, like uh, if you find a bug in your code now, uh, say with MV2, there's a bug, or um, I saw that in .18, they're going to be fixing a bug that has to do with, I think it's AP to AP WDS. You know, something, some kind of broadcast storm problem. So if you have your wireless segregated, well, then you can just update, you know, that that functionality on that router. You don't have to worry about introducing OSPF bugs, you know, via this update or, or vice versa. If your routing engine over here is having bugs, you can upgrade, you know, pretty much that portion, that functionality without having to worry about, you know, changing things on your um, your wireless infrastructure. Still to this day, I'm unable to run... Uh uh, OSPF across ubiquity, AMX radios uh, using broadcast. I have to use MB- MBMA. Uh, period. Yeah, non-broadcast multi-access. That um, that configures it to use unicast um, communication instead of using the default multicast. I still have problems with um, ubiquity kind of pac-manning my multicast as well. Not exactly sure what the deal is there, but I know um, Microtik. Uh, doing Microtik links like uh, like one particular location. I've got fiber actually out to the location, but to do kind of ring completion for it, I do a little SXT hop to another pop I have, and uh, uh, the the OSPF, the Cisco OSPF that's running across that link, and the BGP works flawlessly. Before that, I had a Ubiquity link, and it would work sometimes, and then sometimes I would just OSPF just could not come up on that link, you know, for whatever reason. I found all kinds of workarounds to make it work. I'm, I guess I'm just too cheap to do anything else. So. Well, it, they. I think a lot of times you shouldn't be forced to make it work to 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 work around the the bugs and flaws. I mean, it's obviously, if you're buying radios that cost you know forty five dollars, you're you're probably you're gonna have some things you're gonna have to work around. You know, you, you can't get everything for that kind of price, but still, the frustration factor is there. Definitely. I've seen some people running GRE tunnels or EOIP tunnels across them, uh, and then it seems like the broadcast traffic works fine as long as it's going across the tunnel. So. Yeah, I run um, EOIP tunnels across uh, most of the links on our ZIG network, um, mainly because we have unmanaged switches um, at the top of these towers and can't do VLANs. Um, so that's you know my you know, hanky way of trying to separate, um, you know, a bunch of backhauls plugged into the same switch. Gotcha. So what do you think, Andrew? What's the key to future-proofing your network? Andrew? Cox, can you hear me? Um, we'll message him. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, wireless world the thing most people um, run into is uh, the CPE you know that's the the hardest thing about wireless networks as as more and more people are getting away from 802.11 and going to proprietary stuff um, you know you can swap out your AP but what are you going to do about your customers um, and then, you know, if you want to add an AP to a tower and, you know, slowly migrate customers over to the new system, do you have a new, enough spectrum? Yeah. Say, uh, we, we, we're talking future proofing it and, and building things modularly. What, um, I'd be interested to know, Justin, what sort of overheads do you allow when you're provisioning a new lengths? Uh, I, I know, for example, in, a lot of the links that uh, obviously I work with um, mainly LAN networks and the, the parent company provides us with a lot of our wireless links but say for example we need a 40 meg link we'll normally get them to install a 100 meg radio on the assumption that we'll go up to that band within in a short period of time um, do you think it's worthwhile that people provision things with a, a reasonable amount of overhead or is it just a waste of money to do that when there's new products coming out all the time? 
I my my quick thought on that is you know uh, you know in the the wisp business. Um, the, I guess the biggest focus is okay. Let's at least in our area is let's try to get the bandwidth to them. We just want to get it to them. Um, if we can get you know ten megs to a to a site and start throwing on customers, um, you know that that gets us revenue right away. So you know it's a little bit different than say you have a you know customer down the street that wants a hundred megs or you know wants fifty megs today. Um, you know, we're kind of, you know, at least our philosophy is, you know, let's get it there as fast as we can get it. You know, if we can get a 20 meg link in, great. If we can get 50 megs in, even better. But, you know, we'll be happy getting them something. That's the exact same philosophy that we use. Just build the network as fast as possible um, and then allow the technology to catch up with what you're doing. Um, my attitude has been... You know, if I can build the network, get 10 megs out to the edge, I know that the I know that some manufacturer is going to make something in in a year or two that's much much faster that I can just go out and start augmenting uh, my network with to increase the capacity out to the edges. Yeah, I think Andrew and I are kind of in the same boat in that we we generally have large customers and we just get a fat pipe to those guys and then we manage the infrastructure. You know, we manage. Um, because I do that a lot too, like with our apartments, apartment complexes, you know, we dump, you know, 50 to 60 megs, I guess generally is kind of the normal ballpark. And then uh, we put a router out there, do quality of service and, you know, take care of it all the way down to the wall port. Um, some places we do some wireless backhauls. Um, and for us, generally, we just try and meet capacity plus about 10% overhead. That's all we really look for in our links. Um, is generally we sign people into contracts for three to five years and so we know at the end of that contract if they need more bandwidth a newer technology is going to be out there that's probably going to cost the same amount as the as our commodity gear does today you know in that future time frame that'll support the new uh, bandwidth requirements yeah just like i those, guess there's uh, a uh, uh, you go go ahead andrew uh, i was gonna say i i guess that that could be due to um, both the fact that, well, one, we're paying a lot more for bandwidth over here, mm. so you can't necessarily put put a huge link in, but obviously if a, if a customer is happy with it and you can upgrade it over time, then sell them more bandwidth over time. Um, the other side of it is when we're, when we're delivering to a site we're providing ourselves, um, we, we being both the customer and the provider, obviously if we see there's utilization there and we're getting revenue from the end users, then it's justification to say, let's ramp this up from 50 uh, up to 70 meg, 90 meg, 100 meg or more. So don't have to worry about having people locked into contracts and things because we are the, the person buying that link, so. Okay. so. Another another thing that I another aspect of that that I guess you could take off of is um, so if you're looking to future proof, are you looking to reuse hardware? Say, and uh, you can get uh, a microtech with an outdoor enclosure and antennas, and inside you can actually trade out the uh, the radio card and uh, you know trade out the antenna eventually for newer technologies. Or would you be more interested in using like the uh, uh, the ubiquity uh, rockets, bullets, or the microtech uh, uh, metals, S16. or the grooves. Groove. You know, exactly, where they're, they're a, a built-in, or are you looking for more of a modular form factor? What, what would you prefer at this point, you know, at this point in time? I personally prefer the, uh, the, the integrated units, you know, having to, to yep. build something out of, you know, a bunch of components is, is not very attractive to me. I want to grab something out of the box, slap it together, go put it on the customer's house, collect my money, go on down the road to the next place, do, you know, wash and repeat this. Mm -hmm. um, not really interested in, in putting a lot of stuff together unless it's like an AP. You know, I don't mind to spend the extra time building AP, but on the CP end, mm -hmm. Um, not really interested in building all of them. Uh, you know, putting all these enclosures together, doing that kind of kind of integration. The SXT and the um, we don't we don't run a lot of Microtech wireless. We have we run some on backhauls here and there. Um, most of our um, 
Um, most of our point to multi point stuff is all ubiquity right now. We've got a lot of canopy out there as well. Um, we've got a lot of sky pilot if anybody's ever used that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of transio. I mean, it's kind of a hodgepodge, and you talk about future proofing. I don't know that in a WISP network you can just future proof it completely because you get married into this hardware and you can't just sweep around and have all the customers. You know, you might have a right. 100 CPEs out there and you just, I don't know, just our business model is so lean and mean. I, you just can't go well, run around and swap out all these CPEs. Well, I know, I know at least at least on the AP side you can get a little bit more module, but do you want to get more modular or would you rather just buy uh, an AP that's one solid unit that's already ready to go like uh, the ubiquity rockets where you just uh, screw them right into the sectors mount them up and you're done or because to me I, I actually prefer that all in one form factor I don't really I mean, I've definitely, done it before definitely. but I don't I don't like having to change out the radio cards I don't like you know having to oh, actually it's, assemble anything it adds it's more a failure huge points. Pain having to troubleshoot, like it, having to troubleshoot something that you've custom built. Sure, you get the flexibility, but trying to work out what is there is there water in the connectors that I've made up here? Is there some damage to the wireless card? Whereas when you've got a, a single all-in-one unit, you just go, well, it's not working. I'll swap it with another one. Does exactly. this one work? Yes. It, okay. And it, something. It makes that. it so much easier in the RMA process too. You know, it's like. Because if it's something you custom assemble, whether the supplier is going to say, well, was the gasket good on the enclosure you used? Did you scru screw everything down tight? You know, if it's an all-in-one unit, it either works or it doesn't work. You know, there's there's nothing I could really normally do to it to break it. Yeah, we've, we've kind of taken the, the stance that um, the, the climbers don't really fix anything on the tower anymore. Right. You know, if if you know if it's suspected that there's water in the cable or whatever, you know, th they get sent up a whole new unit, um, whole new cable. You know, usually it's sealed up. You know, as it goes up the, t you know, before it goes up the tower. Um, so there's no opening the box on the tower. Yeah, and I know right now um, on my towers, if I'm running uh, four links on there, I drag up two spare cables and just seal off the ends like crazy, and yep. keep two spare cables at the tower because you know if not just leaks but if you get a if you get a strike or a near strike it's going to cook that cable all the way down so it's you know it's going to be unusable yeah we pull extra cable too cable's cheap yeah it is and while you're pulling you know while you're pulling four it's going to be a pain in the butt you might as well pull one more at the same time or two more yep it's not really that much difference you know, just make sure you seal them up real good, or they will get water in them. We just we just had uh, five cables that we pulled for a job that laid down. Like we didn't pull them all the way to the top of the tower. We kind of coiled them up on top of a catwalk, um, about 60, 70 feet up a tower, and uh, we taped them up real good. But still, uh, water puddled up, and uh, we had to we had to pull the cable again, all of it. It was like six runs. And uh, we had to scrap all of it and start over. You know what I found that I like, and that I actually have some here, is um, what I've started doing with a lot of my connections is using liquid electrical tape. It's basically, uh, it comes in a can just like, uh, like PVC cleaner and glue, only it's black electrical tape. And so you can just smear this nasty stuff inside there, and it dries and it stays pretty flexible. And I've had it outdoors for, um, you know, kind of in a semi-covered environment for several years, and it still hasn't dried out and cracked, and does a really good job of, of staying flexible and keeping water out. Very nice. And, I mean, it looks awful. It looks awful. It does. It looks terrible, but it, it does a pretty darn good job. It's always a good thing. And show the cable. Uh, ship something. What was that? You'll, you'll have to ship something to Australia, or we can use our our own version, which is referred to as Vegemite. <laughs> Vegemite? <laughs> I heard there was like a, a shortage over in, uh, where was that? Or no, it was a shortage in, where are the Kiwis from? New Zealand? <laughs> yeah, they had some shortage of their national version, and they were having to switch over to Vegemite because they were, they were running low on we'll stock or something. We'll include a picture on the, on the, uh, the post so people... People know what uh, Vegemite is. I hear it tastes terrible. But it, lo it looks like it looks like that electrical tape gunk. 
<laughs> Is that what it looks like probably, when it comes out too? Probably tastes the same. <laughs> looks better on the way out. That's what I like to say. Okay, so as far as future proofing goes, uh, equipment. It seems like uh, most of us are of the same opinion. Uh, we like the solid units because we know we're going to get. I mean, what do you guys average on runtime on a piece of equipment? Say, say an AP. What are you looking at? Are you looking? I I was I was around the five year mark. I think Justin, five you said years. like three to five. Yeah, yeah I, we always play in three to five. Um, you know, basically the the reason we do that when we had our last wisp, um, you know, it's now five years old, um, and some of the hardware is still up there. Um, we would have replaced the hardware two years ago. Um, you know, mainly Microtech and Transio. Um, it, it it wouldn't keep up with the demands today. Hmm. We always move it further to the edge. Um, uh, you know, we, we might have a, an AP where, where, you know, demand is greater and we'll, we'll take that down. And, and I'm the, the eternal, um, uh, uh, you know, cheapskate, I guess. And I'm trying to move all the equipment to the edge and reuse it and just, optimize uh, the usage of that. I mean, we, we have some places, especially the 900 meg Transio stuff that we've got up. Yeah, it's back in some cove in between two mountains, and we might only be trying to service four or five people in some little uh, community where there's only like five houses in this right. 10 square mile area. And I'm also wondering, in the WISP business, generally, um, you don't have any competition from DSL or cable providers that that you're the only you're the only player in the game, and if you do have any competition, it's going to be from another Wisp. Um, so, uh, I would think most of your Wisps could, in five years, double their speed and still kind of keep up with the Joneses, but not have to actually upgrade any of their infrastructure, be able to keep their same equipment out there because they usually give fairly low speed links to customers. Does that does that kind of ring true with you guys? It, it does to a to a degree. I mean, we have areas where, you know, um, it, it doesn't make sense financially just to put a, you know full blown state of the art system out there. Um, the customers just aren't there. But you know, we're going into markets too where we're switching customers from cable. Um, oh, really? They don't want to pay 60, 60 bucks a month for cable, um, but they want you know something a little bit better than DSL. Yeah. So you know those those markets can justify it, um, but you know we we are going into areas where where we do have to you know compete with them just because there is so much competition. Everything I wow. do is completely unserved. Um, we don't have any. Uh, area that we compete with uh, uh, another vendor um, like head to head I mean we've got we take on some synchronous connectivity for businesses in some areas like we have, have this one fiber provider that charges 200 US dollars per megabit um, uh, and we've been taking customers away from them left and right uh, just because we're in a good situation with our bandwidth provider and you know we can offer synchronous connectivity much more affordably but that's always kind of an issue for us because we're, we're concerned that if that situation changes um, what do we do then you know it, it basically if our situation were to majorly change with our bandwidth provider it would pretty much bankrupt us at this point gotcha so, so if, if your transit prices or rather your your internet connectivity prices were to go up significantly you're gonna take a hit significantly because we've based our entire business model off of that affordable connectivity so we pass that savings along to the customer okay so maybe another option of future proofing would be uh, find yourself a good provider that's gonna scale up reasonably you know with you over long term indeed yeah we're, we're you know we have a co-location facility we could we could get a 10 gig circuit if we needed it um, we're looking at multi-homing uh, and you know getting our own IP space and working with another facility but this other facility um, you know I got a quote from them just today and and just for transit across town it's like 40 miles um, y'all you know, just got a ridiculous quote on a, on a gig link and they wanted just for like local loop 
they wanted six thousand dollars for a giggy and i was you know it was just six thousand a month plus a nine thousand dollar install so it, so you're know. gonna be doing a wireless shots what you're telling me <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was kind of pricing out some uh, 11 gig license links today. So, okay. <laughs> and that that brings sure. up a good point, you know, if you're, you know, it's it's usually better off to spend money on your your transport and your your back end. Um, you know, one of my my goals has always been we have a big data center in Indianapolis. You know, anybody that, you know, wants to start a WISP in Indiana that I've helped, you know, their one of their first major goals should be somehow to get to that data center. You know, they can buy cheap bandwidth there um, and plus have access to a ton of other fiber, you know, providers. But, you know, they, they have to spend the money um, up front to be able to get there, but that allows their network to grow. They don't have to wait, you know, seven weeks, six months, whatever, to get more T1s installed. Right. Sure. Yeah, I... I as far as I've ever seen, the cheapest bandwidth prices are going to come out of a data center. Um, usually what we call them is carrier hotels. That's what they want to advertise themselves as, uh, where they have um, as many carriers as they can possibly uh, get in to have a point of presence in there. And it just, uh, for one, whenever data centers are getting connectivity from you know, point to point, from various MPLS connections, uh, the more providers you have, the better pricing your customers can get. Uh, but then that also translates to any WISPs that want to hang off there. You've got a lot more options as far as uh, transport, transport prices. For sure. It's definitely going to be cheaper than a T1. We, we did right. a kind of a, a thing here in Indiana. Um, we, we created a co-op of several ISPs. Um, that way we have more buying power um, at the carrier hotels. There you go. You guys unionizing, huh? Yeah, kind of, yeah. You know, break some kneecaps? <laughs> but we're, you know, we're now buying, uh, you know, a, uh, depends on what day um, you want to, you know, I don't want to advertise names or anything, right. but we're right. buying a, you know, good, what I consider, a, you know, fairly decent backbone provider for around a dollar a meg. A dollar a meg, okay. Yeah, and uh, I know some providers out there that are that will give it to you that cheap. Some of them um, have better names in the industry than others uh, as far as oversubscription models go and, and reliability of their network. And uh, you know what? From what I've seen, the, the quality of engineers they can get on the back end. Uh, but it tends to be those cheaper guys, uh, often enough, are a little bit hungrier, more flexible, a little bit more nimble. So you can uh, usually kind of get more out of them if you want to. Um, Andrew, how's the, um, you know, how's the, the the market in australia i know isn't isn't you know you guys are pretty heavily regulated um i, I was gonna say um like what we're saying about having co-ops of people buying bandwidth or, or sharing links things like that there is a reasonable amount of that going on here as well um i mean i know the the company i work for has a number of uh other business uh they call them um uh what are they call them like partners um they're not necessarily business partners as such but partner companies that we work with to deliver services so if they need a service such to a certain location and we have fiber there and we've got um available capacity on it we can assist them with that sort of thing uh there's one one particular area in australia that uh if you're familiar with australia um tasman Tasmania is a, a state that's uh, an island at the bottom of Australia and there's only two main providers who bring fibre to there and the, the cost of getting bandwidth to there uh, is pretty much the same as what I would pay to get transit from Sydney to LA. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. So, so you're saying we need to do some yeah. wireless shots out there? Uh, it's, a, it's a bit far for a wireless shot, like... Um, the 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 gap between uh, like across the water possibly do with, with the wireless shot, but you wouldn't get any great bandwidth over that sort of distance. Um, How but far all is the, it? the um it's close to 50, 60 kilometers from. I was about to say you better um, tell us in miles. That means nothing. 
Yeah. <laughs> what is that? About Thirty miles. Thirty-five miles. Sixty kilometers is like forty miles. I can do it. How much you need over there? <laughs> <laughs> more, more than a hundred meg. We can do it. <laughs> that just means well, he's uh, gonna we'll he's move, gonna keep adding we'll access back, points back. over and over and over. <laughs> no, I was it's gonna say we'll put back to back air fiber points and float them on boys. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I, I did I did write a, an auto aiming algorithm for a pan tilt mount, so I think we could make something happen. <laughs> Just run some twelve foot dishes until the uh the authority to, to go away on the RRP. <laughs> I say, yeah, I when, say. Uh, when someone complains their child's born with like three arms and. <laughs> <laughs> no, what we do is we we go far enough into the water where we're like in international waters, and then we just put a little mast, sink it down, and we'll just do the wireless shot that way. And and, and enjoy watching the pirates come by. Ooh, free uh, free electronics. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you. That's when you point the access point right at the pirates as they're coming yeah. near you. <laughs> Microwave fry. Just cook them, cook them, brother. Well, and the, you know, the uh, another thing to future-proof your network, kind of like what we're talking, is multiple backbone providers. You know, um, you know, guys can go out of business. Um, I've been around, you know, long enough. Uh, been through the dot-com days where, you know, you call up your backbone provider. We're sorry, this number is no longer in service. <laughs> you know, and if you're if you're tied to those guys, you you, you got problems. Yeah. And plus, you know, there's always all kinds of mergers and, oh, you know, what we did yesterday, we're not doing today. So, you know, you yeah, got to change. My data center just got bought out, so I'm, I'm incredibly uh, uneasy right now. Nervous. We had a, a wholesaler that we were buying some of our circuits through, and they were, they were there one day, and we were paying them, and the next day they weren't, and they weren't paying the people that we were uh, getting our circuits from. So we started having rolling disconnects on our circuits that we had through these guys. We had to start making emergency phone calls and getting stuff up. So, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. You just, you never know. Um, and I guess in the wireless ISP business, you know, uh, redundancy's sake, if you're, if you're in one town and you've getting connectivity, if you can start building towards another town that has connectivity in kind of a diverse location, you're probably doing yourself a big favor. That way, if yes. your, your networks got segregated somehow, you'd still have connectivity from both sides. Indeed. Oh look! Like the, the the simplest, the simplest problem that that arises is that everyone has a failure at some point. You do. Even those companies that that you know say they have a hundred percent uptime, they still have outages. So. Yep. You you get a, a second provider and you 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 negate that that outage for yourself. That's right. It's not a not a matter of is... if. It's a yeah. matter of when. Yeah, offering a 100% SLA is, is a nightmare in and of itself, and it puts That's undue stress on your employees. You should give them a lot of time off for things <laughs> like that. I'm just saying. Uh, it's compounded momently. But, you're, but you know what? What's funny is you're talking about uh, you're always going to have outages no matter what you do. Like computers, servers, hard drives, there's moving mechanical parts. They will fail at some point. Everything has a mean time between failure. It's going to fail. And then sometimes life will reach out and get you. Um, uh, lightning, near hits, um, uh, not sabotage, I guess, people hitting something with their car. Um, and then one guy, my favorite case was, uh, he was saying that he was putting his stuff on the side of a mountain. It's this guy in uh, South Africa. And I was telling him, he was like, hey, you know, I've got a, a friend named JJ, and uh, he had some ice fall on one of his radios one time, because you know, that's like in our mountains, we have problems with that. And he's like, yeah, we don't really have ice. Uh, we have baboons. They love tearing <laughs> our radios up. And I said, are you serious? And he goes, this is Africa. And to me, that's like, ah, oh, God, I felt, I felt, you know, about as tall as an inch, you know, so small. And just, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess that's Africa. So it's just, you never really know what's out there. So a baboon just might get you to Mars to be ready for it. We had some we, uh, uh, come up and throw beer bottles at our sectors on a tower and like smash some of our our older antennas with with some uh, like you know like some forty bottles. Uh. <laughs> I know somebody who had um, some cable running up the side to an AP and some kids used it to scale the roof. They used the cable to to scale their way up the roof. That was nice. It didn't work a, after uh, that. A term for 
fibre disconnections in Australia. It's a uh, it's called a backhoe attenuation. <laughs> <laughs> right, Someone's right. getting their their dig on, and oh look, is there some sort of cable there we've just cut through? <laughs> it's all this live. There's one for you. Not <laughs> backhoe attenuation. <laughs> what is that? this? We had we had some backhoe attenuation a while back. We had the misfortune of having some of our fibre run right over the top of the water main. So they're going to put in a tap, and they just, just right over the top of it. It's a nightmare. I hate that. It's just a short stretch, but I hate that stretch. We it gives me heartburn every uh, time. On what they, uh, you know, consider a protected sonnet ring, um, with one of the national carriers, and uh, we had an outage one time that lasted 27 hours. Oh. Well, they're their idea of a protected sonnet ring was conduits in the ground two feet away is the protected oh. ring <laughs> well <laughs> backhoe backhoe buckets usually more than two feet wide yeah yeah and they're not usually they're, they don't nibble they don't take little bites either they're kind of big kind of big bites that's ridiculous <laughs> that breaks the heart I watched a guy pull a 400 count out of the ground one time, an AT&T 400 count with a backhoe, and uh, uh, it just—I mean, it was like a—it was like a peacock tail. It was just like, and it was all lit up as soon as he just pulled the bucket up out of the ground. That's nice. Uh, at A and M, one of our colleges here, uh, they had fiber running between buildings in a steam tunnel, and one of the steam pipes burst. And you should see the picture of it. It's just. Fiber, 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 and then there's just this huge, melted, gelatinous mass <laughs> just sitting, laying on the floor. It's like, I don't, how do you, how do you, how do you prepare for that? How do you account for that? And I was just thinking how, because it was a chunk of like six feet that got melted out. So, you know, guys had to go in there and splice onto both sides of it. It was just uh, horrible. Speaking Genius. of splices, speaking of splices, fiber and splices. Um, that was one of the topics that I was wanting to uh, to cover. Justin probably knows more about this than than uh, myself. But uh, when you run the fiber up the towers, Justin, what what do you uh, mechanical splices? You puck and polish. You you outsource it. What what is what is your strategy there? We actually just buy pre-terminated fiber um there's a couple companies we we buy it from um and we've we found that we can buy say 300 feet um we can buy a 300 foot run of multi-mode fiber um i'm trying to think how many strands um six six strand um for about 250 dollars shipped um nice. and even if you you know buy the you know the corning opticam ends with no polish and things those things are 10 15 dollars a piece yes, so you, you know on on six strands you have you talking about the unicams ends. yep the unicams the the ones okay. that there are no polish right and, those are the mechanical splices yeah you know you, you have what's uh you know what's 12 12 times 15 you know you you basically have half your fiber in just ends, um, not including your labor. So, you know, we just, you know, if we have extra, great. Um, you know, we try to have an extra 20 foot or whatever. But, yeah, we just buy, you know, it comes on a roll and we just up the tower it goes. Yeah. So and the, the great thing about ordering that preterm stuff is, is it's always guaranteed. It's pre-tested. When it comes to you, we still pre-test our stuff. But no matter um, what you want, whether you want multi-mode, single-mode, multi-mode, 50 micron laser optimized, they'll give it to you. If you want the corning bend insensitive, you get that. If you want uh, armor clad, which is basically you can hit it with a hatchet and it's not going to hurt it, uh, yep. you can get that preterm. You know, And that will easily strap to the outside of a tower and go straight up. Um, and Don't have to it, worry about your text going through 10 ends and running out on the day they're trying to do their install. Exactly. Or uh, some guys do puck and polish. If it's particularly cold outside, the glue's going to take forever to harden. If it's too hot, it's going to harden too fast. Um, the mechanical splices, you don't get as clean a cut you know, as you normally would. Um, it's just there's so many advantages, especially the time saving. You can get any guy... They can pull a cable to pull preterm fiber. 
There's yep. no specialized knowledge. Just tell them not to hit it. Don't don't tie a knot in it. You know, use some common <laughs> sense. And we've can got get it some done. municipal jobs right now where all the buildings have fiber pulled between them, and none of it's terminated. And uh, you know, I've been tasked with uh, either contracting somebody to terminate it or doing it ourselves. So we were. You know, we were trying to figure out, you know, oh, what do we want to do? And, you know, it looks like you can get the uh, the, the Corning Unicamp kit, you know, the, you know, for about seven, eight hundred dollars or so. Um, and then, you know, this is a six count fiber. Um, it's a single mode fiber on each end. It, there's probably about a half mile in between ends. And and uh, just trying to figure out what we want to do at this point. I mean, it looks like there is some money for us to be made. Um, if we just get the kit and do it ourselves, um, versus my, having someone contract it. So. My, my thought on that is the, the advantage of a contractor, and this is, you know, something you'd have to ask the contractor, is can they certify those runs? Um, you know, do they have the, you know, do they have the, and I don't know, Greg can probably help me out here. You know, I call it an oscilloscope. You know, what's the, you know, I, I've been on jobs where the guys bring in the, you know, the thing that verifies it and prints it out and says, you know, this, here's, here's the stats. Yeah, it, it's called an OTDR. Okay. And with an OTDR, they can actually send light and then uh, see how much reflection is. If there is a break, they can tell you physically how far it is into the cable they could tell you but you know what to me if you get a contractor to come out there uh those guys and you mean not all of them but on the, all the ones that we use they guarantee their work so if they come out and do a connector today and it breaks two years from now you know for some reason they will go and fix it even if it's 3 a.m they're out there fixing it and i'm not having to pay for that i'm not having to get up and and deal with the blowback from it you know it kind of limits your liability in the whole situation, right. I, can, I can imagine there's some merit to uh to learning to do it yourself though. Like if you if you want to do your own terminations and things, alternatively having your your contractor come out and actually watching them and and learning from them. So obviously they're the people that do it every day. So yeah, the more I've got you know, a, a a friend in the neighborhood that he was operating a, a GPON network, uh, uh, and. And unfortunately, his business adventure failed. For, you know, failed him miserably. Uh, he paid the price of the early adopter, and he's got Fusion Splice hardware. And you know, I've spent some time with him and and watched him terminate. So, um, you know, he did everything himself. Uh, they ran, they ran, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of underground uh, uh, fiber on this passive optical network. Um, and he did everything with fusion splashes. You know, he had a thirty thousand dollar apparatus. You just pop both ends in, hit a button, and you were done. You know, if yeah. you were splicing it, and uh, it would line it up. It was so amazing to watch it. It would just line it up on a computer screen and and do some magic, and then it just kind of melted them together. Yeah. Then you just you slide up the the tubing, put it in the heater, and you move on to the next strand. So you know, what? when I learned to do all that stuff. Uh, the thing that I really learned was that I didn't want to do it. You know, <laughs> it's like that's cool and I can do it, but I never want to do it again. Cat five, I I I, I do cat five probably. I still, even though I'm the engineering manager, I still have to do cat five probably every three or four days. I'm terminating cable or I'm punching down cable. So that inevitably I'll never get away from. But fiber, I can easily get out of, and and I refuse to do it anymore. It definitely well, sounds I, like it even, is. Go ahead, Andrew. It, it, even Cat Five. I mean, you look at oh, we've got a new new um, new student accommodation installed. That's a bunch of forty-eight port switches, a bunch of uh, a half meter long Ethernet cables. So I'm not going to make them up myself. That would take me most of the week to do and test them all. You, you know what if we started I, doing? I they're already done. What we started doing in the data center uh, is uh, we order pre. -t I this is going to sound so lazy. We order preterm uh, Cat Five. Cat 5e, and it'll come in bundles of 24, and then uh, we we get our uh, knot guys to pull all that stuff, and then we put in modular patch panels that have basically 48 couplers on it, and then yep. we just pluck, 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 and then I mean it's up in no time flat, and we didn't have to do anything. I mean yeah, it's going to cost you more, but if you look at the price of labor, um, you factor the time and 
expense that it would take to actually do all that yourself. Um, it works out usually about the same, even if it is slightly more expensive. You saved a lot of time. I like some know. of those new Panduit ones that have the little tab that flips under the tab. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, if you just bump it when you're pulling in, a, you know, another cable out or something, if you bump the, uh, you know, the release tab, it doesn't just fall out on the floor and you go, whose cable was that, you know? <laughs> well, that comes back to you should be uh, labeling every single cable. Right. <laughs> it's silence. Exactly. Just, just, just crickets <laughs> chirping after I said that. Chirp, chirp. The, the patch was another one we used in the past, just for the cable management and the fact that they actually have uh, uh, kits that come with like 24 or 48 cables, and they're all unbagged. They're all un untied. They're just ready to go. So they've got tied in one big bundle. Whereas if you're buying them from from a wholesale like we normally do, well, here's 500 bags. I've got to tear the thing off, and pull it out, and yeah. the twist ties. There goes half my day just doing those. Yeah, the the preterm, the bundle, the bulk preterm we get comes already in one big uh, nylon sock. So it's all bundled together. They even will stagger the ports for you. So it'll be like 1 and 25 will be shorter. And that way, everything cleanly dresses right in. And um, they'll also stagger them for whatever chassis you're using. So for us, all of our hardware, like our 6500s, where we plug in customers, uh, we preterm everything. So it staggers nicely, goes back up into a patch panel. That way, our technicians never get near uh, the actual hardware. They just go to patch panels. You know, every patch panel is labeled. So all I have to do is tell this guy, plug a cable from, you know, this place to this place and then up here plug it from this place to this place update our documentation and I mean that's it it just it makes it so that anybody that can read can do this well I had a uh, uh, data center job um, we ran six fiber cross connects um, in this three-story data center and we hired a contractor to terminate the fiber we we ran the fiber um, dropped it, you know, dropped it in place, and then as soon as we got the first one done, the, the fiber contractors came came behind us and and terminated the cables. Um, and those guys, they they got it down to where they were doing uh, one end every five minutes. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad, or you know, but that's that's Pretty the good. pace that they kept. Um, I know I couldn't do it in five minutes. Yeah, I know we have guys that. Uh that if we do have to get it terminated, they come out and they puck and polish. We don't usually do mechanical. Um, and those guys puck and polish, I think, for about 40 to 45 bucks a connection. That's usually what it cost us. Per per termination, it's about 40 $45. Dollars. And that's puck and polish. Half of that is materials. Yeah, so it's... it's if you think about it, you're getting the... Um, you're getting the peace of mind that somebody else is warrantying this. You know, they're going to test it when they're done with it. And uh, and another thing is I don't have to get up from my desk. That's really nice, too. <laughs> <laughs> See? Cause you guys can't tell from the Skype window, but Greg actually goes like this. It's fat <laughs> on the lower side. If you... I, if, I, if, if I can go a day without having to get up, it's been a good day. <laughs> you know? It just... Because... I'm the kind of person that I focus on one thing at a time and I, I'm like, I laser focus in on it. So if I get interrupted and I have to stop, then I have to kind of reacclimate and get back into it and it just, it drives me crazy. Like, uh, here these last few days I've been, um, uh, I've been working on a program. I know this is completely off subject, but I've been working on a program. So when I have to stop and come back, I just, I have to get my brain going back again. So. I thought you were sleeping and watching TV. <laughs> no. No, not when I'm at work. What is what is it they say? Lazy people come up with the uh, the the better and more efficient solutions because they don't want to do as much work. Efficiency experts, man. Efficiency experts. Um, so we talked about future proofing. We talked about fiber, uh, fiber termination. Um, one one I thing I wanted to add let's on let's the, the fiber fiber thing real quick is we found running fiber up the tower if we're going above 200 feet um fiber is only about 200 dollars more for us than running cat five 
Huh. So we get the, all the benefits of, you know, uh, no water in the cable, um, you know, the, the electrical isolation, everything like that. Because um, we figure if we're going to run six runs of Cat 5 over 200 feet, um, you know, we're going to burn through at least two boxes. So, what are you guys rocking at the top of the tower for, for you know, converting back to... Media to termination? Yeah. We're, we're using industrial switches. Um, usually they're an eight port job with two fiber ports. Um, to be switching it, to RB2011 soon? Yeah. Probably. <laughs> you know, something interesting on that, uh, I just talked to a distributor today. He's, he was said that, uh, I, uh, I was surprised and that, uh, Microtech is fulfilling all of my orders and they're shipping now. So I should have, them. Um, uh, I think he said... Uh, available on the website Friday and shipping Monday, so that might actually include those new um, 2011s with the uh, the SFP ports. Well, I would oh, just have good. to hit up that website. I'm sure it's uh, probably somewhere in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to be vendor neutral. Vendor neutral right now. So we'll we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> right. Right. But anyway, so Andrew was saying, are you guys going to be switching to the 2011 to get the SFP termination, which would, I guess, eliminate uh, an entire piece of hardware? Because you could use the, uh, say you could use the five ports and just uh, turn on the ASICs on the five Ethernet ports and uh, have them as act as a switch. You know, Without a doubt, I'm going to. Yeah, my, my only concern will be how they will uh, fare the weather. How are they going to hold up? If I got a device, you know, 450 feet on top of the tower, is it going to survive the Indiana weather? Are you are you encasing these in like a NEMA enclosure? Yeah, they're going in a NEMA enclosure. Um, we've been buying the um, extended temperature switches, um, which there is an actual specification for an extended temperature industrial switch. It okay. goes down to like neg 30. You're still putting a router in there, though, right? Our, our routers are at the bottom. Okay, so the routers are actually at the bottom. So the only thing you have up at the top are APs and your industrial switch that comes down, and then the router is at the base of the tower. Yep, we got uh, industrial switches, um, the POEs, and that's pretty much it at the top. That's funny, because I was thinking heat at the top, but you're actually talking about cold. Yeah, we, we haven't had problems with heat. Um, we've had problems with cold. Um, when we first started, we, we got two switches that were not the extended temperature, and they were rated to zero, and almost like clockwork, um, about 4 a.m., a couple days, um, it dipped below zero, and they would just, they would lock up about 8, 9 o'clock when the temperature raised, they'd come back alive. And I guess, unfortunately, those switches were too efficient to put off enough heat to keep them warm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, funny. uh, what's... What's the cost on something like those extended temperature switches, if, if you don't mind saying here? We've been buying them um, for $175 a piece, I think. Is that um, with an optic in them? Yes, that is with the uh, the multi-mode optic in them. See, that's not, I mean, that's not bad at all. Not at all. No. Um, they're a 6-net switch, 6-net brand. Um and they, you know, they perform well. Um, we haven't had out of, you know, close to 50 towers now. Um, we've not had one fail. You said those are unmanaged, though, right? So you can't. They, they them are anything. unmanaged. That is that is the the problem. See the difference between a industrial managed switch and an un unmanaged switch is about a thousand dollars. Wow. Okay. That's a so big what difference. size that frames will they handle? Um. Good question. We've not run into framing issues yet, um, but they are, you know, uh, an unmanaged switch. So. Are you going to try and run, like, jumbo frames or something, JJ? No, no, no. I was just thinking, you know, I, I like a little wiggle room in case, uh, you know, I, I don't like to rely on uh, change TCP MSS on... on I got gotcha. you. So what JJ is talking about for, for you guys that... Uh, maybe don't know is the the frame size or the like the MTU of the packet um, is max maximum transmission unit so it's it's the largest amount of uh, data you can squeeze into a packet before you try and send it across a network if you're swinging across an, a layer three interface and the MTU of your packet's bigger than uh, the MTU set on the routed interface 
um, it'll do one of two things. It'll either fragment the packet, so it'll chop it into smaller pieces and send it on, or it'll drop the frame and send back a specialized ICMP message that tells you to readjust to this rather MTU. If you hit a layer two device like the switch they're talking about and your packet's bigger, it'll just silently discard the packet. It'll just go into the bit bucket and you'll never know why. So an um, MTU on the layer two device can be actually a pretty big deal. Anyway, that, that's that's my addition to the conversation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think about those uh, those those kind of going off and you know veering off and uh, like I like to do you know on the <laughs> here. Uh, uh, the hot lava. Uh, let's uh, let's save that for it. last, JJ. Let's save that for last. I'll make a quick note. Okay. <laughs> let's put this one to bed real quick. Um. So that's cool. Yeah. So I don't even know what are the what are the temperature. Let me look up the temperature specs really quick on that um, router on that new router board. Yeah. If, if it's extended, you know what I would consider ex extended temperature. That's going to solve you know a lot of problems for um, for several guys because it's hard. It's very hard to get a managed. Managed is expensive, and then yeah. you add in managed gigabit. Um, and you're, you know, you got a couple thousand dollars of electronics at the top of the tower. For sure, I hate, I hate having anything that's not managed. I'm such a, a control oh. freak, I guess. But uh, it says the temperature range on those guys is negative thirty centigrade to positive okay. seventy centigrade. So Good. It's what is that? Pretty freaking and, huge and range. Justin, Justin, if we, uh, if you have any problems with them, I'll, I'll do you up a script that just runs a constant bandwidth test because you're only going to be using the switching functions anyway. So Use the router CPU, heat it up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, it might use one or two watts more power, you know. But how about we just we just in, we just put a toaster in the top of the tower with it? <laughs> what are they, What are they? Six six watts. So uh, we can we can schedule it so it only turns on during winter. So in winter you've got an extra one to two watts power consumption <laughs> with that. There you go. And keeping it warm. Got, I've actually got a 2011 to to deploy tomorrow at a site that we we need more ports and so it'll be the first one I actually have on my network um, but I deployed two at a courthouse uh, a couple months ago and one of them locked up about two weeks ago um, they had it plugged into a drop cord uh, none of the wiring was done when I go into these places it seems none of the wiring is done and I just kind of have to like hodgepodge it all together it comes after me and and uh, finishes everything. Well, they didn't plug it into a UPS or anything, and and it, the one in the basement was completely locked up on them. So they did a reboot, fix it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Did. Yeah, I've had issues uh, where the like the watchdog or whatever doesn't necessarily pick up and reboot the unit. Um, that's only happened, I guess, a few few times or whatever. Well, that's cool. So so these may actually be shipping pretty soon. Um, That'd be cool, especially with that temperature range. It's managed, so now you can at least ping it, turn on the switching ASICs, let them do what they're going to do, but you can still ping the device to see if it's up or down or kind of what's going on. And tests and things like that as well, I think. So For sure. I, and I think there'll be a lot of value just to see time. if an interface is, is up and running or not. You know, is the And what it's linked at. You know, yeah, is it yeah. full, is it 10 half, you know, what it actually link at. Exactly. If you're having issues, you can hard code yes. them, 100 full, 100 full, to whatever. That, that, that is one of the things that we religiously do. Um, uh, we have a lot of interference from, you know, from, from low band radios and stuff we're co-located with. And, we have to force Ethernet on on each end, so I can't just most of the time I can't just dump in unless the cable run is really really short. We refuse to just dump into you know if the cable runs 100 foot or so, um, I can't just dump into a dump switch. I gotta know what's on that other end, otherwise you know I'll start getting these bottlenecks and I can't track them down um, unless I have that visibility. It's crucial. I've known, I've known but I think the RB2011 for me personally is probably my favorite Microtik router that they've made uh, in some time. Personally, I don't know. I'm very interested to, to deploy it and see how it goes because there's a lot of our sites that could benefit from, from that. I, I, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really excited to see them go. But to say it's my favorite, I think right now the 751 is kind of my favorite. I've deployed like a million of these little things right now. The little, um, 
uh, the MicroTIC. It's, it's basically the 750 with uh, the extension on it so that it's got three antennas, runs okay, yep. th two let chains ask, on one and then the you other. Guys this. Do you guys anywhere have a need for a million packets per second? No. No. Um... So can I say what's uh I don't know what that works out to. I guess it depends on my traffic. But yeah, megabits per second is gonna be different. Yeah, like are are we talking about large packets or small packets or Yeah, uh, I was gonna say let, megabits let, per let, second. Yeah, yeah, let's say it's a, a gig, uh fifteen hundred bot frames, a million packets per second. Okay. Well the the larger site we have um in terms of speed uh is currently about two hundred 80 meg, um, but that's being done on x86 because you can't get the CPU performance on anything else at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see if something like the the CCR will be okay. useful for okay. that. Right. Yeah, every, everything for me that's say 50 or better, I do on an x86 just because I could put an x86 together really cheaply. Okay, well, uh, I was just curious. Yeah. Um, and anything that's a really high speed link for me, it's Cisco. It's going to be a Cisco core. If you would you be interested in a product that was affordable that did that type of performance? It dep I think it depends on the application. I would never use one in a data center environment where there's absolute guarantees on um, equipment because um, that's a whole different conversation. We'll get into that another day. That's right. a black hole. I don't want to go down. But uh, <laughs> for for ISPs I, I, kind of at their border, I can see I can see people doing that. As long I as it's got the the feature that they're looking for, I, you're being kind of vague. So yeah, intentionally. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I definitely would consider using them uh, um, at that border, the site setup, but alongside something else. So. Yeah, and yeah, and for sure, for me, uh, a border router needs um, uh, a few things. It needs, uh, you know, whatever dynamic routing protocol, it needs to be able to handle that. It needs to be able to handle uh, your access list, so your firewall needs to be able to, you know, because most of that stuff's going to be done via the CPU. So just raw packets, I mean, that that's not very indicative of what it can really handle, and then it needs to have some quality of service capability. So I'm willing to bet something move in that much traffic uh, that many packets probably doesn't have a much CPU left over to handle any of those other things. Right. Depending on what product we're talking about, since we're being so vague. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Yeah. That's my that's my opinion. It's got to have all the features I want. That's some good feedback yeah, there. Well, I don't know anybody that just has a pure router like that on the edge. And if yeah. it, and my, my thing is, like, like Greg says, if I'm going to use it in the data center, I got to be able to call somebody and it gets fixed. I don't want to go through a forum. I don't, you know, um, you know, if I use Cisco in the data center because if I got a problem with it, I can call somebody and it's fixed. Right. And oh. also, Cisco carries that, that name. So if I get a customer in here that's never heard of Microtech, I can guarantee you they've heard of Cisco. So. They they like the sound that that kind of comfort factor whether it's warranted or not it's there, just off the name. Indeed. I was just curious yeah, what you guys thought there. To me, something that moves that much raw data, lacking features, isn't going to attract a lot of people in the WISP industry. How's that? Sounds good. Yeah, if it's that critical, if it's moving that much bandwidth, it's a high value piece of equipment. Agreed. Okay. Uh, it, it, my, my attitude on it is is if, if you're moving that much traffic, you're not worried about $100 routers. No. I mean, Lord, no. Yeah. Not even close. At least not in this country. Maybe other countries where, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe money's tight or something. I think people would rather pay for the peace of mind. All right, so did we put the, uh, did we put the, uh, the fiber to bed? Fine by me. Okay, so we put the fiber to bed. Um, what's the next uh, part? So we're nearing uh, an hour, so let's try and put a bow on this baby. Um, let's see, what's something quick that we could talk about? 
Let's How? do the uh, the oh crap moment. <laughs> the Let's oh crap. All right. All right. So now that Justin said that we'll do the oh crap moment, everything will break on the recording, <laughs> and I don't have the heart to restart it. So this is this is it. We get one shot. So um, I was doing a, a little article a while back because somebody brought me a knot of cable from a no crap moment we had. Um, you know what? I'll just talk about that one. That one's more interesting and more fun. Um, I used to work at this place called UCS, and we had an uh, an analog phone system uh, back there, back in the day. And um, uh, we were switching over to voice over IP, Cisco call manager, and so we had a, just a ton of like 50 pair copper that was just dead, you know. And so uh, a whole army of underpaid employees. So they told us, okay, we'll pull all the unused stuff out and recycle it. So um, you know, I, I made note. Uh, of everything that was unused and so I started removing it and then I was getting ready to leave for the day and there was a guy that was going to stay till about 8 o'clock I think for whatever reason so I showed him which stuff to go ahead and finish off removing and the uh, guy's name was David super nice guy super nice guy very eager um, uh, and uh, you know I, yes just very eager let's just say that he's a very eager guy Really nice guy. Anyway, he took over, and I left. At about 6:45, uh, I get a call, and he says, uh, "Hey, Greg, um, I, I cut I cut one of the wrong cables, and uh, it's the one that goes to the call center." So I was like, "Oh, okay. Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, just meet me there at five in the morning, and we'll fix it." You know. And so I got off the phone, and uh, you know, I complained to my wife a little bit about it, and then you know, went back to whatever. Ten minutes later, I think maybe 15. I get another phone call, and it's David again. He goes, Greg, I uh, just cut another cable. <laughs> I said, David, are you serious? Um, look, just put the put the cutters down and uh, leave now. And uh, <laughs> meet me up here at 2 in the morning, and we'll fix it. So we left, or rather he left for the day, and then uh, we met up there at 2 in the morning. We're up on the ladder, and so... We, we removed the sheathing from uh, from one of the cables, you know, and then he removed it from the other one and start splicing, and then uh, from this copper cable, and I started soldering it, and I was like, oh, my God, this is taking forever. We're never going to finish it. So we started just twisting the cables together in electrical tape, and we ended up at the end of it uh, in the middle about a baseball-sized mass of electrical tape, just this huge blob of black tape then we just kind of tucked up in and hid it in there and uh he finished his five minutes before the call center opened up and somehow all of the lines that were in use still worked it was it was oh, like wow. amazing it was like amazing i don't know how but it somehow worked because i know in there um it was inside each sheathing was two identical uh, this is the interesting part that I didn't mention. Inside the sheeting, the, the outside sheeting, there were two individual rolls inside that were color-coded uh, with just a little pull string. And uh, he had uh, cut the pull string back from all of them, so he didn't know which one was which. So he just oh, started no. putting them together, and somehow he lucked out and got all of the right pairs together. <laughs> oh, wow. It was amazing. So that was that was one of my oh crap moments. It's like... Uh, and that one wasn't necessarily caused by me, but it was a it was a an adventure, and it made a memory, evidently. And uh, uh, I'm sure I, I've got plenty more um, that I that I can probably dole out over time. And I know these other guys have some too. I know Andrew has started twice now on his, so hopefully he'll make it through. Maybe Andrew's the cursed one. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Yeah, we we, we started this before and had to retry. Um. Oh, my one, my one was pretty simple, uh, and I'm sure many people have done this to make myself feel a little bit better. Um, I was doing some work on a a consulting client's route. Uh, I set up their core router, and I've set up a couple of their site routers, so we'll come back to a single data center. And at the same time, I was also doing some testing work on a on a micro tick uh, VM. Uh, which we had running just on a trial license because we were testing some new new configurations. So, 24-hour trial license, shut it down when you're done with it, and that way you keep the time so you can bring it up tomorrow and continue your work. Anyway, so I just finished this. So it, was, it was like 4:30 in the afternoon or something. So, oh yeah, I'll uh, I'll just shut down this router system. Shut down. Cool. And I've just looked up at the uh, uh, 
the heading and suddenly realized it's the it's the client's core router. Oh crap! <laughs> <laughs> so I called them up. Called them up. I'm like, um, I've uh, I just wanted to let you know I I accidentally shut down your router. I need someone to repower that for me. That's uh, that's not a particularly easy phone call to make. <laughs> but uh, fortunately for me, the the guy thought it was quite funny at the time, so <laughs> they they just restarted. They had, they had internal access to it uh, via IPMI, so remote access card. But that wasn't available to me because I was external to the the site. So uh, and they only have one upstream at the moment. So there's a there's a um, another point about. The old future proofing, getting a second upstream or a backup. <laughs> <link. laughs> but yeah, I mean, I can think of a couple of times I've shut down routers that weren't the ones I wanted to shut down, or I've hit shut down instead of instead of reboot. Reboot, and you but, have to get someone to repower. But you know what's worse than that is is having to email a customer and say, "Can you issue this command?" <laughs> Because I just removed your default route, or I just removed the IP address from your interface. <laughs> oh, oh wow! Okay, the the worst one I've ever seen is, uh, I don't know why they have this. I think they should fix this in the router OS terminal. If you push Control V, it switches to auto complete commands. So if you start typing in SY, it'll jump straight to system. System. 